Hello everyone. As we move from Old to Middle English, we start to see more and more similarities with our own culture. For instance, Middle English is legible to modern readers of English. Barely. And so we do not necessarily need to read it in translation. However, it is still very difficult, so most students, including you all, will read Chaucer's Canterbury Tales in translation. In this presentation, I will introduce you to Chaucer's work and to the sections we will be reading. Let's get started. As we move forward, we are jumping ahead in time from the 1st century to the 14th. Geoffrey Chaucer was born around 1343. Strict records of births were not typical at the time, and many have since been destroyed. Typically, the records we do have are baptismal records. Baptisms were usually performed around three days after birth if the baby survived. Speaking of which, the Black Plague started in England around 1346, when Chaucer was around three years old. For the next few hundred years, the plague would continue to ravage Europe and England, off and on. By its end, the English population is estimated to have been reduced by a third. During Chaucer's lifetime, the feudal system was in considerable decline, giving way to a mercantile system. Thus, earned wealth and merit started becoming indicators of power and status, as opposed to birth and inherited wealth. Indeed, John Chaucer, Geoffrey's father, was a prosperous wine merchant. At least, he was prosperous enough to send his son to receive a classical education. At the time, education was neither mandatory nor was it free. Only the wealthy and the noble could afford to be educated. This is not to say that the lower classes were completely illiterate. Merchants still needed at least some reading and writing skill in order to keep accurate records. Chaucer's education included training in philosophy, languages, and rhetoric, which was a typical education program of the time. He knew French, Italian, and Latin. As an adult, Chaucer held numerous diplomatic and administrative posts, and he earned enough money to be a member of the middle class. But we should be careful with that term, since today's middle class is different from Chaucer's. For the sake of simplicity, however, it's safe to say that Chaucer was in the middle of society. He was neither a member of the lower class, nor was he a noble. His socioeconomic status did offer Chaucer a unique perspective, because he encountered a wide variety of people, from the impoverished to royalty. And it's this perspective that serves him so well in the Canterbury Tales. The Canterbury Tales is unique in a number of ways. First, it was innovative. Most serious literature at the time was written in French. However, Chaucer chose to adopt English, the common vernacular, for his work. Additionally, Chaucer chose to use rhyming pentameter for his poetry because it more accurately conveyed the rhythms of ordinary talk. The Canterbury Tales is a collection of stories from nearly every social status. Unfortunately, Chaucer never finished his original plan of 120 tales, or Maybe fortunately, if you're a student assigned to read the whole thing. For his work, Chaucer adopts a persona, a portly bookish, well-meaning, rather dim-witted sort of chap, not much good at making love or poetry, but doing the best he can. Perhaps to dissociate himself from any dangerous or upsetting opinions. As such, now is a good time to remind students that an author should not be confused with the work's narrator. Think of it this way. Marshall Mathers uses multiple personas throughout his work, including Eminem and Slim Shady. He even adopts different vocal stylings for them. Just like we should not confuse Slim Shady with Mathers, we should not conflate Chaucer's narrator for the Canterbury Tales with Chaucer himself. They are not the same person, and so they will not always share the same ideas. Chaucer's narrator uses the prologue to introduce the tale and its characters, all of whom are on their way to Canterbury, which was a pilgrimage to the town's famous shrine of Thomas Becket, who was murdered in the cathedral. To pass the time, the host holds a competition for who can tell the best story, two for the trip there, and another two on the way back from Canterbury. It's that you each, to shorten the long journey, shall tell two tales en route to Canterbury, and, coming homeward, tell another two. Whoever best acquits himself and tells the most amusing and instructive tale shall have a dinner, 
paid for by us all. The first of the two characters we will focus on in this class is the Miller. According to the prologue, the Miller was a burly fellow. He was barrel-chested, rugged, and thick-set, and would heave off its hinges any door or break it, running at it with his head. He bore a sword and a buckler by his side, a loudmouth and teller of blue stories, most of them vicious or scurrilous. In other words, the Miller is, the kind of, is kind of like the stereotype of a drunk uncle. He's simultaneously fun and rude. Therefore, anything he has to say, for instance, on the topic of marriage, should be taken with a healthy amount of skepticism. Still, his view of marriage is rather revealing, so pay cl close attention to how he represents both men and women in marriage. The second of the characters we will study requires a bit more explanation, mostly because she is so unique, even among Chaucer's colorful cast of characters. The narrator has the following to say about the wife of Bath. There was a businesswoman from near Bath, but, more is the pity, she was a bit deaf. So skilled a cloth maker that she outdistanced even the weavers of Ypres and Ghent. She had been respectable all her life and five times married, that's to say, in church, not counting other loves she had in youth. She knew all about wandering and straying, for she was gap tooth, if you take my meaning. No doubt she knew all the cures for love, for at that game she was a past mistress. For your information, the term gap tooth was slang for a lascivious, lustful woman, a woman who could not control her sexual urges, in other words. The Wife of Bath's prologue is a surprising text, especially for our perceptions of early English culture. It's a surprising and rather crude proto-feminist rant, Proto, because it was written long before the feminist movement had organized. This is not to say that there weren't women, and men, who advocated for increasing women's rights in society, but they were rare, and they were not politically organized. Additionally, it's unclear if the tale is meant to be taken seriously or not. Nevertheless, the ideas are expressed, and so it's interesting to deal with them. The Wife of Bath's basis for authority on the topic of marriage is experience. Experience, and no matter what they say in books, is good enough authority for me to speak on the trouble in marriage. As the next examples demonstrate, she also argues for women's sexual enjoyment in marriage. The Wife of Bath states, And tell me also, what was the intention in creating organs of generation, when man was made in so perfect a fashion? They were not made for nothing, you can bet. Our little differences are there to distinguish between the sexes, and for no other reason. Who said no? Experience teaches that it is not so. But not to vex the scholars, I'll say this, that they were fashioned for both purposes, as to say, for a necessary function as much as for enjoyment and procreation, wherein we do not displease God in heaven. In short, the Wife of Bath is attempting to argue that God would not have made sexual organs if he did not want us to use them. Likewise, he wouldn't have created sex as a pleasurable experience if he didn't want us to enjoy it. She goes even further to suggest that women should enjoy sex with their husbands, which is not something many argued at the time. For the time period, sex was purely for procreation and nothing else, much less enjoyment. At least, that's what the church and political leaders argued. Of course, as we know, people are far more complicated in their personal experiences. The Wife of Bath argues that, Why else is it set down in books that men are bound to pay their wives what's due to them, and with whatever else would he make payment if he didn't use his little instrument? It follows, therefore, they must have been given both to pass urine and for procreation. In married life, I mean to use my gadget as generously as my maker gave it. Since women are given so little in society as far as sociocultural power, they should demand control and enjoyment where they can get it. And that includes the bedroom. Whether or not Chaucer meant for the wife of Bath to be viewed as a joke, the ideas he presents through her character offer some surprising arguments in support of women. 
arguments that would not see any traction for another few hundred years. Thank you for watching, and please let me know if you have any questions.